Okay, does anybody have any questions before we uh, move on? We're going to go back, go through this example. Yeah, the stick diagram. Stick, the final stick diagram is uh, down here. So I just realized the problem the confusion was coming in. I was trying to add the TGO method for uh, using the Morgan's law in order to be able to do the math. And I realized what the confusion is is that there's actually there's two ways to do it. And so in this example, I showed both paths to it. So hopefully this could clarify all the confusion. So, the formula is not A and B or the quantity B and C or E. First path, you do not do Morgan's at all. So let's say you choose not to do Morgan's. And in this example, 1.7. So the full down network is going to be the same. Are you, are you able to see this one? Yeah, I'm going to come out on the recording as well. So A and B, when the pull down network, this says A and in series or in parallel. So the A and B is in series, or D and, so D is in parallel with C or E. Now, if you don't use De Morgan, you flip it around in the pull-up network. So in pull-up network, and is in parallel, and or is in series. So A and B, they are in parallel, and then you do it in series with D and, so D is in parallel with C or E and C, E or E. So the second method is with the Morgans. So the reason I had this with Morgan is a common mistake on the exam is people will forget to put this and in parallel or in series part like we did over here. So I had this with Morgan as something you could do to keep the and in here because the pull down network and is in series or is in parallel. If you do the Morgan, when you have a pull up network, your and is going to be in series and your or is going to be in parallel. So choose whichever one you like. One it is to the right answer, it's perfectly acceptable on an exam. So on this portion, same thing. If A, B, and uh, the NOR gates are in, in series, because it's an OR, D is ANDed, so it's in, I mean, yeah, so I'm sorry, A and B, they're in series. D is in D and quantity C or E. So we do De Morgan's, we get not A or not B, and not D or not C and not E. So in that case, again, ands are in series, ors are in parallel. So we kept it the same. So not A or not B are in parallel. And is in series, not D or not C and not E. So now it's coming on the same path. So apparently you came in a minute late. What I did is I saw there's some confusion going on about how to do the DeMorgan and when I would have to. So there's two methods you can do it. One, if you do not do the DeMorgan, you start with ands in series and ors in parallel. Do it this way. And if you don't do the DeMorgan, you flip it, you get ands in parallel, or in series. If you use the DeMorgan, ands in series, or in parallel, you do the DeMorgan, and then ands in series, or in parallel, for a few months. And the reason I uh, introduced that topic with that objective was because the common mistake I've seen on the uh, class A's exams is they forget to put up this and in parallel or in series. So I included the DeMorgan as a method to try to help you. But whatever way works when you're trying to sit in one exam, whatever way works for you is perfectly acceptable. So then from here we draw our path diagram. So from VDD, we have to go through A or B to get to this point. And then we go through D or C and E to the output. And then here, I, I put out in the middle for, uh, but you have ground. Ground, you can go through A or B. I mean, A and the and B, just like here, to the output. Or you go through C or E and then through D. And then we use those path diagrams to actually draw out our stick diagram. So, we're going to follow the path diagram right here. So here we go from B to D through either A or we can go through B. And then from here we either go from C and E to the output or we go through D to the output. Now here, this portion where we have these two metals, that's where we keep the four grams in between them. 
but it's all down network. You can put through A and E to the output. So you can go through A and E to the output. Or you can choose C or E. So here, you can go through E to here, or you can go through C to here. And then both paths have to go through the E transistor to the output. So that's how that solution works. I remember I was doing the, um, the drawings last time that one of the rules was, I did the example before I did the TGO, one okay. of the rules was uh, to overlay the uh, pool, or is the pool up network? Yeah, the pool up, the pool down network, um, to overlay the flow diagram. Okay, yeah. you, okay. Um, this is, if you, if you took this and overlaid it with that, if you did it in a certain pattern, like if you, if you follow the, uh, the mouse, if you're going like this way and you're overlaid it, it would go like that. And then C or E would go C or E and then through D and then you'd have your output and your ground here. So overlay is a technical thing. Um, I will accept any path diagram that shows the correct path. Um, yes, for these representations like you need I'm thinking, like, what if you swap B and E? Yeah, they're not unique. You, uh, you may, if you were to swap these parts, you just have to make sure the one thing you can't do is cross metal and create a short. So, I on the example I'm bringing, I will make sure that it's logically correct. Can you go from uh, the P well to the N well to V out on the same, like, node? Meaning, like, here? They would say you had, like, if I had P uh, at the top, like, straight down. Yeah, yeah so that's actually, you kind of do something similar in, I mean, I'm going to scroll all the way back up. That's what, kind of what we do with an inverter. So if we, you're talking about this instance here, correct? Something like this, where we have the VDD goes through the uh, PMOS, they, they connect both the yeah. P well and the end well. Yeah, that is perfectly acceptable. If you have an instance where the same poly is the same deciding circuit that you care for an inverter, then yes, absolutely. Any other questions? So I'm going to go through like a, uh, another example. It's not posted as a required problem, this problem here. However, uh, you are, uh, I encourage you to do this. I'll give extra credit if you include this on your submission. Uh, so basically, this is a a portion of a what is known as a carry look-ahead adder. Um, if you remember from um, for those of you who took computer, my computer architecture and advanced digital systems course, where we talked about carry select uh, and carry look-ahead adders, um, we have to calculate how to, how to do the carry look-ahead, and this is part of the logic. So the way the problem is phrased is that the logic is. G equals, and you have a set of inputs, G3, P3, G2, P2, G1, P1, and G0. And so this is design a compound gate to compute G bar. So that helps us because we invert the signal, and then we just put an inverter here on our output. So now, this is the reason why I think this would be a good problem for you to practice is because it's a good problem for you to become familiar with how the and and or rules work. So, the way I did it is I started from right and worked left. So remember, ors are in series, I mean, sorry, ands are in series, ors are in parallel, we'll pull down network. So you have G0 and P1, and they're in parallel with or G1, right? And this gets anded, so it's in series, so here's P2. And that becomes OR with G2, so that's in parallel. And that becomes ANDed with P3, and that becomes OR with G3. So that's our pull down network. Same thing, we use ORs in series on the pull up network, if you don't flip it. So then that becomes ANDed with G2, OR, AND, OR, and, and we come back to our original G0. So you see how this kind of lays up like so. So here's the, so I will ask you a concept question as we go through this particular stick diagram. So here's G0, P1, G1, P2, G2, 3, P3, and we 
that we you can know them all. The path that I ran. Uh, so, you, so here, like the G1 is either go through P1 or P1, and so forth. And you can start P2, P3, and so forth. For here, for the pull-down network, it has to go through these neural P1 because it's an AND, or one of those two, or I can start here. And you can see. Now, I have a question for you. Let's say I did something like this. Let's say, uh, so I've kind of told you the answer, but I haven't really. Let's say I have an equation A and B or C quantity A or B. You're going to have to do this in the morning with the inverter on the output. Okay, let me. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. That is correct. But, so I start, we do our, you know, we do our and, so we would do or, so we would just there be in series, just like this one we did before, C, and then A. B. So this is pretty much just the same answer, except we are replacing. Um, I can just scroll up to the previous example problem. It's the exact same answer. Instead of D and uh, C and E here, we're replacing it with another A and B input. So we'd be getting here. So uh, instead of let me make sure I get the variables right that I'm replacing. Yeah, C and E. So here for the stick diagram, instead of having C or T, we have another copy of A and B. So how do we how would you actually get to implement that? Oh, so I replaced this A and this B. So I have polys for a second A and a second B. My question is, how can we ensure that this value of A and this value of A would be the same? Yes, exactly. We connect them. And you can do all kinds of different things. You're kind of alluding back to what you were asking earlier. There's no one right answer. Um, some people will put a contact here. And you know what I was alluding to? This is right now we just have metal, but there's metal one, metal two, metal three, and metal four. So these lay on each other in three dimensions. So one trick is people would just do like a metal two here to A to A, then B to B, keep them four, and then you're not compromising that kind of width. And it's just a very thin layer of metal. Right? I'll get your question in a second. So that means you now have to see values. Yes, Tom. So you would want to lay the contacts after the VDD or the ground? You mean like, if you're, okay, so when you're designing it, when you, when, this, is, this is a little outside the scope for the time of because you'll eventually learn how to use the electric field as I design tool. But you're going to lay contacts here when you create the VDD, but then you're going to create another contact within the design rules to make sure that the metal is away from your diffusion region. And you would have that metal connected to the poly and then connected to the second poly. Does that answer your question? I think so. I'm not until we start asking people to do a lot more. Does anyone else have any other questions? So 1.7 is required. The carry look ahead adder is for extra credit. All right, so. I'm going to start talking about how can we use some of these other uh, transistors as other kinds of logic. So it has transistors in this sense where we're just using that gate as a switch. Right? So then we're going to, so sometimes there's logic and actually uh, this is kind of what I did for my uh, dissertation using pass trans, uh, dual rail pass transistor logic for transmission gates in order to do something called reversible logic, because if you go forward, then backward. So, we'll officially define a class transistor. 
for TGO 1.21 as an instance where an NMOS or PMOS transistor is used as an imperfect switch. Now, in section two, we're going to go a lot into the concepts of ideal and non ideal transistor theory. But for the, right, for the time being, an imperfect switch is we have to apply a certain amount of threshold voltage in order to create the channel. So it doesn't just you apply the channel that happens immediately, there has to arise times capacitances that we have to worry about. That's why the definition includes the word imperfect switch. For 1.22, the transmission gate is this drawn here. And you'll see these often, especially when you're dealing with multiplexers. Where you have G and G bar attached to a um, attached to a PMOS and NMOS that are in parallel. Their sources and drains are connected, and you have an input and an output signal. So the way it works is with G is, in this case, if when G is hooked up to the NMOS transistor and G of R is hooked up to the PMOS transistor, when G is zero and G B is one, that means this switch is open, and when G is one and G B is zero, the switch is closed. For output, if you have one and zero, you can get zero and zero and strong one, which is closed. And when a one and one is passed, we give us a strong one. And the reason why we can guarantee that is because we have them, remember, because of the fact when we consider that a PMOS transistor is going to take BDD and supply it to the output and the inverter, that means it passes a strong one when it has a zero on the gate. So that's what it's going to pass a strong one when there's a zero on G. When you have a zero and you strong zero on the output, that's because we have a one on the NMOS transistor here, and then zero is able to flow through there. So now we can guarantee that both zeros and ones can flow through the pass transistor within the transmission gate. Mm -hmm. Guys, we're done writing. I'm going to show you an example of how these transmission gates can be paired together to do a two to one multiplexer. So, before in other classes, we probably learned about there's different logic where you use an, a set of AND and R gates to do a two to one bus, right? And now we know that an AND gate requires six transistors, and an OR gate requires six transistors, and an OR gate requires four, and so forth. How can we do it in four? That's what we're going to use. To do. Yes, sorry. Like is, uh, sorry. is A related to G or some G B? Because what if uh, like uh, it's written G equals to one and G B equals to zero? Okay, what so if A is one? If A is okay, so if A is one, that this in here, right? So if A is one okay. and G so G is zero and G B is one, the switch is open. That means we're not allowing it through. Now, for all other instances, this is where we word out G equals one. So we have it a strong one on the gate of an NMOS, allows it to just operate, right? It'll allow it to go through. And G B is zero and will allow this to go through in the PMOS transistor. So once we get that instance, that's when we worry about this case on the right. When zero is on the input at A, like you asked, what's going to happen is it's going to flow through the PMOS transistor. I'm oh, sorry, zero, yeah, no, zero is going to flow through the NMOS transistor. My apologies. Zero is going to flow through the NMOS transistor. And if it's a one, PMOS conducts that through the channel. PMOS will conduct a one through the channel when there's a zero on the gate. And when it's a zero on the source, we have, we have a one on the gate for this case, which means the NMOS will conduct it. So it's strong, but it's not perfect, which is why in T0.1.21, we define it as having an imperfect switch. Does anybody have any other questions? So this is our 2 to 1 multiplexer with four transistors. So what's going to happen is it's zero to zero where we have our select and select bar, right? So if we have two to one locks, we're going to use select and select bar is our way of saying we don't want to select 
this one and this one, right? So if select is zero, and select bar is one, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a zero on this key mod transistor and a one on this n mod transistor here at the top. That means we're also going to have a one on the key mod transistor and a zero on this n mod transistor down here. That means this transmission gate is activated. So whatever signal is here on D0 will be selected. We flip it around, S is equal to one, S bar is equal to zero. That means this key MOS transistor is switched off at the top. The N MOS transistor at the top transmission gate is also switched off. Bottom, this key MOS transistor is on, and so is this N MOS transistor. So that means whatever value is gonna be at D1, if it's zero, it's going to go through the NMOS transistor if it's one, it goes through the NMOS transistor. Therefore, we've now kind of for every possible instance in a two to one way Does that make sense? Yeah? So it's so not it. Uh, you do, the one thing, the one disadvantage of this is that, like I said, there are imperfect switches, so you have to let's eventually do some restoring to do some. You use buffers or like a pair of converters, and you will, and I'll show you how to uh, do that later in the course. But basically, if you start getting degraded signals, you have to restore it. But that's doable. But this using this method saves you a lot of a lot of area, a lot of area. I do want to go over uh, briefly a couple of uh, sequential elements that we can use these uh, transmission gates in as well. The bottom one, 323, is a D latch. And here, we're just using an inverter, one, two transistors, one, two, and three. We have two, four, six, eight transistors in your D latch. So it significantly reduces the area. And just like before, with D is zero. Here we go from SR latches, we have our SR equivalents. And then Q and Q bar. Thomas, what's important about Q and Q bar? Never, ever, ever, epic, ever, Q equals not Q. <laughs> <laughs> so you can fix the uh, C uh, G planet and Yoda. <laughs> Q? Never. Q not Q equals Q. That's correct. So if E is zero, the state's going to remain the same, and then you want to reset to another value. I'm going to scroll up a little bit so I can show you some operations while you're writing that down. So basically, this is kind of how it's composed. When clock is equal to one, it's going to turn this transmission gate on, so that way it passes the signal through, and then we get Q and Q bar. And we can physically guarantee that because Q circumvents Q bar with the inverter here. And this transmission gate is switched off. That's how mm -hmm. you can see how the clock and the clock bar flip. Actually, you might not be able to see it from there. So if you're looking at this on the screen, the N MOS is at the top of this transmission gate, the P MOS is at the bottom. And here, the P MOS is at the top and the N MOS is at the bottom. So they're flipped. So that's how it works. And then when clock is zero, this transition gate is on, this transition gate is off, so it's keeping the same state. The same state. <laughs> is that table of order too? Yes. Yeah. Draw it, define it, and write the table. Doing that. Oh, while you guys are jotting that down, very good job on the homework assignment. You guys make it very easy to grade. N no. What are you doing? <laughs> 
Happy Professor equals happy, right? If you were to draw Q equals not Q, what would that look like in the diagram? You just invert it with drawn, and you just have two more wires in parallel. Okay. So let me uh, scroll down a little more. So this is just showing the clock diagram of how it works. As remember, as when the clock is one, we want to change the state to the current state of the input. So here's what's physically happening. E changes, but Q is zero. That means Q is zero. That means this transmission gate is on, and this transmission gate is off, sort of staying at the same current state. What happens is when clock becomes one, you're turning on this transmission gate and turning off this transmission gate. So whatever value is in here is going to come here and cannot be held until that clock signal comes down. Okay. So as you can see, when V is 1 and clock is 1, that's when Q is going to change. And when Q, the clock is still high, then V comes back down to 0. So after that, Q becomes 0. And, so the, and this here is just the very Generic DQ uh, circuit diagram. Why does the clock switch on the bottom? Um, I'm sorry, which, what are you talking about? On, on B, on mm -hmm. diagram B, on the first clock, uh, it inverted clock, it switched to normal when it was A. The, or the inverted clock is the clock. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What, what do you mean switches? Do you mean a signal for the transistors? Or? Well, from the top to the bottom, the, the, the Regular clock is inverted on the bottom but not on the top, and not clock is inverted on the top but not on the bottom. Okay, so it's a wall body open. Oh, you're talking about so basically what the point is is that so we switch the PMOS and the NMOS transistors because we want the switches operating in an opposite way. Okay, so we don't want them both open at the same time. So here's the general idea of what's going on when we have this one on. It's giving us the new signal. Right? And what's going to happen is clock changes, then we're going to switch. Once this one turns off, then what's going to happen is the current value being held here is just going to loop around. So now it's memory of it. Yeah. So. And I'll kind of go over again. You can basically take the D latch, double it, and turn it into a D flip flop. Uh, I don't think we're going to go over any other sequential. Yeah, we're not going over any other ones. So I want to cover these two specifically because this is a very good uh, example of how these, it's almost the exact same thing as a multiplexer where the clock signal is the mux. So if we recall uh, from advanced digital systems where I had you guys do the Shannon expansion, with a multiplexer and brought it down just to a mux and then a couple of inverters. So on that specific problem, you actually design this. So now you know what's inside the mux that can make it even smaller. So those are maybe one of my advanced digital systems class. We took chain expansion, which is a method of just uh, selecting one of the variables and facing the rest of the logic off of it. So in this case, the variable that would be selected is clock. And then you would just have A not B or A B not. That is, which is the logic for a multiplexer. In this case, we have two multiplexers, two inverters, so now we just double it. And this allows us to simulate the exact same logic as the D flip flop from before. And then the same thing, but here's the, here's the interesting part. You probably noticed that this here is your PMOS, 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 and PMOS, so they're flipped. So here, when clock is zero, this switch here, for those of you watching your video later, figure B, this is on, it's off, so it's held, but it's stopping this one in the middle, right? Because the switch is off. So now what happens is clock changes. We're no longer accepting input from the D flip-flop. We have this memory element saved, and now it's loaded up in here. 
There was 10. This is off. We now have separate memory. So now this is the flip back and forth. So I might even, hold on, uh, just so for those of you watching it later on the video, see if I can go any more. I'm just zooming into 124, let's see, one four, on the diagram. So you can see that's supposed to be the PMOS here. This is a PMOS, that's a PMOS, and that's a PMOS, where the hand was. So let's go back out to 100. Yeah, there we go. So does anybody have any other questions while the last uh, couple of people are jotting this down? Okay, so I'm going to uh, scroll down. Okay, hardware description languages. This is very important to know these three things. Um, behavioral structure and physical modeling. Um, behavioral modeling is an explicit definition of mathematical relationship between the input and output with no implementation information. So what that means is F equals A over B. The mathematical relationship. So this is behavior model. So again, that definition is explicit definition of mathematical relationship between the input and output with no implementation information. So a little later in this particular lecture, I will show you an example of why these different models are important. It's trade-off in synthesis time versus work time. For structural modeling, it's the implicit definition of I.O. relationships through a particular structure using interconnection of components. So what, you, what the uh, advanced digital systems students did last year is they would build components, they would build AND geeks, they would build adders, they would build key flip flops, and then you put them together to build elements through the interconnect. So using that logic, you can use A over B, or you can use actual physical logic, like we did, I had them do if 
A equals zero and B equals zero. The reason why is because if you use that specific logic, it'll actually synthesize to a lower area. As opposed to just this. Because the synthesis tools, the electronic design automation, they have different algorithms based on the type of modeling that you do. And this, finally, physical modeling, which you've seen a couple of examples of already in this course. Uh, details of how the system is laid out in the physical space. So, state diagrams. The inverter, right? So we did two input in NAND, three input in NAND, we did an inverter. We actually saw how it was physically laid out. We used our lambda-based design rules. That's physical model. So, ideally, what I want to do when I show you this, uh, uh, this Galan Jaffe chart here, you want to try to build different models based on what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, uh, one of the four design rules from last semester, uh, good design rules, is, you know, make the copy as fast and good design requires good compromise. So you have to do a trade off. How much time do we have to do this project? If you have only a little bit of time, then you worry so much about area because a very compact, low area design is going to take you some time. And that's what I was trying to get Kevin to say instead of fear, but hey, he's a grad student, I can't blame him. Um, but so you have to, and the design flow as, as well as what you're physically implementing, you have to make these kind of choices. So for those of you who eventually want to be a project manager, it's definitely a good idea to keep these different levels. Uh, in mind. Um, what's the, oh yeah, so sometimes you'll see behavioral modeling also written as functional modeling function. Um, and you also see physical modeling is geometric. And the reason why is because you have actual ranks and widths that you have to re are required to. So if you're looking, if you decide to go online, you're looking at some references, and you see geometric modeling or functional modeling, you have in fact learned that. And uh, for example, we'll go down to physical modeling. Here we have, this is a very famous chart by Jocelyn and Khan. Um, basically, it's laying out the different levels of your structural, behavioral, and physical model. So here they actually have both geometric and functional. So at the lowest level, polygons are when you're using your building up those squares and your polygons for your lambdas and uh, for your polys and your metals and your fusion regions and n plus and uh, n minus and t plus, right? So now for structural, you're using those to build transistors. That's how we use the flow through our pathway. And then functional, a lot of this is based off of differential equations. So we're not really going to go much into differential equations. Most of that deriving has been done for you for the equations that we'll see, particularly the ones in chapter two. Um, but then the next level, state diagrams. If you're familiar with those, you can use those to represent gates and Boolean equations. So we have our F equals A equal or B. You lay out the stick, you lay out the gate. Standards. All of this, you're going to be using these to build your standard cell that you're going to put together to tie it together with your interconnects. Standard cells, your register transfer language, RTL. And taking, especially in this, you send something to the RSMT logic unit, you send two inputs, perform an operation, and turn it back to the register or you're doing shared topological or all kinds of different elements, you're doing this at the architectural level and the RTL language. So this is the physical implementation like you did in DHTL. And last, dealing with the whole processor, memory switch. Functionally, you're actually using these to perform algorithms. So you want to make sure it's turning complete, it can do any operation you need it to. And then, I'll go over this really briefly here in a couple of minutes. The idea of a full floor plan. You're putting all these cells together, and then you're going to use algorithms to try to minimize the area and power consumption and lay it out. So, if you remember that video from last class, you have the pins. You're going to 
take the metals, move them up to the pins, and then you can actually put inside the chip, which you can then put it into a computer and run it. So this is the general idea of how the uh, Gatsby uh, con chart works. So. I'm going to scroll past this because if I let you uh, guys write this, this one will take a really long time. Um, but it's on the video. Okay, so the first hardware description language was written by Gordon Pell. I'm name dropping here because that's me that I got to meet him in 2012. <laughs> um, also, good life lesson. The means is him, and that is his lovely wife in the background. And, uh, she, uh, <laughs> she came up to me and she said, are you married? I said, no. So she grabs me by the arm, she's real strong. She goes, you have a responsibility to marry a smart woman. <laughs> which, which I took as, I am a smart woman. <laughs> but he's a very nice guy. I got to attend the Turing Awards in 2012. And uh, Gordon Bell, who's now also the head researcher at Microsoft, is, was there. I guess I can tell you all kinds of uh, goofy stories from that. Um, but anyway, so uh, the key thing is they, they started coming out with these in 1972, and then that, the military tried making uh, their own uh, hardware description language. That's where they came up with HTML. And then industry tried to come up with those their own. That's where they came up with Verilog. So and most of this stuff I've already told you, but here's the key thing I want you to remember. I'm not, I don't have this as a TGO, but this is a very important thing for the rest of this course. So the question is, if we have these tools that can synthesize everything down for us, why, and most, and here I have, like most stuff is done using synthesized design, why do we have a specific course for custom design? So custom design involves specifying how every transistor is connected and physically arranged, where a synthesized design uses these tools and builds them down. The majority of commercial designs are synthesized today because synthesis takes less time, engineering time. However, custom design gives more insight into how chips are built and into what to do when chip thing, things go wrong. Custom design also offers higher performance, lower power, and smaller chip size. So next, uh, next semester, in the next semester, next spring, I'm going to be offering a synthesis and optimization of digital circuits course, where I'm going to be taking these higher level courses and implementing algorithms for that. So this is an example of an actual job solicitation that is available on Intel right now. So it is an ASIC SOC design engineer. ASIC is often abbreviated as ASIC, it means application specific integrated chip. And SOC means system on chip. And so, uh, uh, job description, Intel Custom Foundry business, which you are not familiar with since you've seen the video. Um, they're seeking highly motivated people for their ASIC design team, ASIC physical design, implementation and verification, computer aided design, mm -hmm. design automation. Minimum from qualifications, BS in electrical engineering or computer engineering. I'll to your question in a second. Hey, look, that's you guys. <laughs> So everything that's underlined in red is what we're learning in this course. So the outline, as I told you before, somebody's going to be looking through and going through a checklist. So here's the key thing. It says, any combination of the following experience obtained through academic coursework, projects, research, and or relevant job internship. So that's what, here's what's in underlined. So when you're doing projects in your courses, you should be comparing what you do in your projects to these, to these lists here. And if you say, oh, I have a project, put it in your list. So, for example, lot, so logic verification designers, RTL, register for transfer language, you know that. Digital design, you know that. Computer architecture, VLSI, synthesis. Gate level simulations, you'll be doing that in this course. Static timing constraints, you'll be doing that in this course. ASIC implementation engineers, digital design, VLSI CMOS, synthesis, automatic place and route, place and route clocking, which is one of the labs we'll do, clock tree synthesis, where you're basically taking a lot of different of, of these cells and arranging the clock tree, because clocking takes a lot of power, so you're basically taking a lot of different cells and arranging them in a way that you can 
been synthesizing the clock tree and actually trying to reduce power consumption. BLSI CAD tools, performance verification, LBS, DRC. LBS means layout versus schematic, and DRC means design rule check, and we'll be doing both of those in this course. And all the rest of these are kind of just repeated performance verification LBS. So you can see how these kind of work out. So I can actually um, show you, I'm going to, no, I'll just email it out later. I think I may have made one. Um, I'll, I'll email out the resume that I made, and you guys can look at it and compare it and use that. You're more than welcome to use that format. Um, I notice I did a quick list here of different abbreviations. Um, DRC is design rule check. You're taking your design rules. You've learned those, the lambda-based design rules. That's your DRC. Your electrical rule check, making sure that everything meets the standards for different voltages, different currents. Uh, APR, automatic place and route. It's a synthesis method where you're taking the cells and laying it out a specific way and you certain set of rules. Uh, LBS, layout versus schematic. Layout is kind of that schematic is just your two pull-up and pull-down network, and how does that, how are those trade-offs? So we'll be showing an example here in a minute. Um, EDA is electronic design automation, and tape-out is the final result of the design cycle for integrated circuits or printed circuit boards to the point at which the artwork for the photo mask, so the photo mask, we have the lights going through, we're going to do a lacquer to try to uh, tell us where we want our, our, the views are in, and uh, things that we won't be covering in this course, but there's two abbreviations on there I figure you might want to know anyway. Built-in self-test. Um, a really big issue in computing is you know, guaranteeing operation. So there's actual uh, entire fields where you're basically doing testing, testing and fault tolerance. So it's one of these things is you actually build in the testing into the chip itself, built in cell test. And the joint action test group, or JTAG, is a standard for printed circuit boards using boundary scan, which is a debugging method to watch integrated circuits, pin states, and measure voltages throughout the layout. Okay. So a brief hip history of Verilog. I've kind of, is there anything in that I haven't told you? Okay, so modules. So everything is consistent of modules. So when we see this layout, we're actually going to have modules. And so you have a driver circuit, and you actually have your actual, for example, we have Andy, we have the driver that generates the signals for the input. We're going to have the actual NAND gate itself. And then we're going to actually have the circuit where it takes in the, the driver signals to stimulation, and then takes that right into the NAND gate and produces the output. So. That's how the module works. So in this case, the one I just described would be like system computation one, computation two. So the NAND gate would be part of the system, and it receives stimulus signal. So you can have, let's say, you're building a um, a full app, right? You need NAND gates and OR gates. So NAND gates and OR gates, you, you need you have a module for an NAND gate with a module for an OR gate, and then you put them together in a specific way inside of your system. So here are some examples some of some Verilog resources. Uh, Verilog.com, hopefully, yeah, has all kinds of things you can look up here, how to get Verilog. There's all kinds, whatever one you like best. Verilog training, Verilog bookshelf, frequently asked questions. All kinds of very useful tools for you there. Um, I can also make the Xilinx tools are, are available on, in the um, in the lab upstairs in the th in 302. I think the room number is. You can either use Vivaldo or you can use the Xilinx uh, that I provided. Also, we have this website iverilog.com that actually you can actually take some Verilog code and run it. So here. This will be a uh, TGO here in a minute, but this is actually a whole world function. So you have module main. In this case, there are no inputs. We'll go over the concept of inputs here in a bit. So you, every module starts with initial and end module. And then you, for each part, you can get or end. Dollar sign is plain, which is similar to printf. So you just put hello world, 
finish. And so I'm going to scroll down here, so I go run the code, and then you'll see it says hello world at the bottom. So that's something that's available to you as well. Um, one thing that's very important about Verilog parameters is when you do equal expressions, say if A equals 5, or assigning different elements within Verilog, nets and registers, primitives and instances, and we'll be going over kind of what all of these mean, that all sort of too much at the moment. But continuous assignments, procedural blocks, and task and function definitions. So we're going to be going over an example here of Mandy and how all of those tie in. These TGOs are the same. That sucks. Yeah, ignore. You know what? Hold on. Which, well, I don't even need to go in there. Uh, let me see which one of those I skipped. I have a feeling I know which one it is. Uh, okay, yeah, don't write out all of the TGOs for the... Um, the, this one, this is not a TGO. This is the actual 1.27. I want you to actually physically write out the whole world code. So, uh, so again, what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, module main, initial, and end. So, so module main, you have initial and end module. And then you have a begin and end on the inside. Dollar sign display. Oh, we're going to use the semicolon and uh, quotation signs just like you would in C. And it ends with a semicolon. You do not, you do not put a semicolon at the end of that module. It's just like this. So the instance and Instantiation, which is 1.28. This is the example here, module main. Now you also have your inputs, and then what happens is you, you're doing multiple modules in the same file, which I'll show you the example with the NAND gate. Um, you can use either ports and the implementation and an end module. So you see how this one over here contains a name, doesn't have any ports, so it's not necessarily necessary. The implementation, begin and end, and then end module at the end. So you need to let it know when it starts, when it's finished, when it needs to run, and how it's actually going to run. So what's 1.29? Ah, and then I define ports here. So this is a one of the main differentiations between Verilog and VHDL. Verilog allows for a third type of input that runs a lot better. So, for example, uh, in VHDL, there's input and output. It does allow in and out, it doesn't play nice when synthesizing. Verilog deals with this a lot better precisely because you're able to synthesize at the transistor level of Verilog. So the ports, Verilog modules have three types, input, output, and in-out. In-out are bidirectional. So this would be beneficial when you're doing a transmission gate. Because you have A, you have your PMOS, you have your NMOS, and B, right? So you have F and F bar. Right? So you can do the signals this way, or you can put signals this way, and you can just define a or B is in house. So A and D would be instances of ports. Your implementation, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of how to actually do transistors. There's multiple ways, of, uh, there's multiple types of transistors in, in barrel pump that doesn't exist in VHDL. <laughs> like those in and outs. Uh, earlier, we had, you were showing us where we put. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with, 
Oh, but what switches? Oh, we had yeah, we've got a switch here and a switch down here and yeah. yeah. And so we would use in and outs for Yeah, because in that specific that's a really good question. So if you're running if you're running an email app in the flip flop and grab log, you would probably want to define these as in and out because you only want the flow to go one way. So if this flow starts going the other way for some reason, it would throw an error. <laughs> The current and transistor app, doesn't it just go from like a source to drain? Is it just one direction or can it go both directions? It can go, it can go both directions. So, um, not to talk about my dissertation more than you already want, but the whole idea of EMAG logic is recycling energy. So, you're, when you're having uh, the current go, uh, by the way, you're storing, and we're going to learn about this in the next section, you have an output capacitance. So you're going to be storing the charge there, so that's what's actually holding the value of one when you raise. So what happens is AI value logic, instead of dissipating that energy into the environment when it's done, it tries to recycle that energy back backwards through the circuit to take it to try to it's because you don't want it before you lose energy the most of it is when it gets dissipated so it's good. So So you kind of have an example of what I've just been talking about. You have your module, you have your inputs and outputs. So what you do, here's what's different than VHDL. You just list the names of the inputs and outputs here. So you have in one, in two, out one, out two, and BID one, so that's for bidirectional. So to instantiate them, input in one, in two, semicolon, output out one, out two, semicolon, in out, BID one and then you would end the module. And just like uh, we showed in the hello world, not all modules require ports. Okay, so at the bottom, uh, I have this module A, P1 comma P2 comma nothing comma P4. This is something you were kind of allowed to do in VHDL, but you're not allowed to do in Verilog. Yeah, that space, you can't just have empty ports. Every port in the definition has to have something there. In Verilog, if you were having a port, remember how you could have a certain number of inputs hooked up and then just leave some blank? Here, I mean, you could. When you actually run use it in a, in a higher level module, you put zero or one there, or undefined, because it doesn't impact your your operation. But you have to have something in the instantiation. You can't do that. Okay, so uh, QG 1.30 is just this line only. Eight parameters are a constant value declared within the module structure. And so, for example, we have this module shift. So this would be a simple way to do shift on a property. You can do parameter weight 32. So you remember uh, in the MIPS data path, you get an input, and we get a third digit value, one of those bits is lit to tell us which one it is, right? So we have a, we define width as 32, Width minus one to zero is shipped out, data in. And so we can actually use these parameters to change it. So let's say you did a, like last semester, we did a 32 bit architecture in this, but I come up and say, hey, the project's going to be an 8 bit. We just change the parameter from 32 to 8, shift left logical, and shift right logical, or not. That's how we can use parameters to uh, improve synthesis time. Okay, so I have a little weekend assignment for you. Um, so here you follow this link, vol.verilog.com slash vol slash main.htm. And I want you to look over the first two chapters. So what you're going to do is you're going to click begin and then is actually is a lot easier than it looks. A lot. 
So you're going to scroll through here. But at the end, chapter overview, there are like, here there's 10 questions. And it has an instance of which of the following Verilog structures may occur outside of other structures? Parameters, ports, modules, and instances. What do you guys think? Parameters? Instances? How many say, how many? Wow, we have everybody's. Modules. Modules. The reason I want you to go through these and I want you to do the first two, you just take a screen capture of each section, put it in a Word document, and email it to me, and that'll be sufficient. Um, but the reason why uh, I want you to do it is to say, hey, kind of make these mistakes now, and then you have something you can refer to so that when you're doing parallel block coding, and why isn't this working? I mean, go back to this website, you know, your free website, you can plug in code and see where your errors are, all kinds of. Hopefully, I've provided you enough tools where you can troubleshoot and figure uh, things out quickly. But yeah, so that link is uh, shown here. DOL.Verilog. So do chapters one and two. Uh, just put them in a Word document and email to them. My email is morrison at olmiss.edu. Kevin's not here. He has to do the third chapter. Okay, so um, we're going to go... Really briefly, uh, on your own, you can look at this link as well. This actually shows how to build a NAND gate in an electric DLSI systems uh, design. This is an open source program that runs in Java. Since Java compiles down to a virtual machine, it can be run at virtually any operating system. So that should be free to just be able to run on all of your laptops. And so, as an example, if we recall the NAND gate, so we have our two-input NAND gate, we have our path diagrams, and we have our stick diagram, right? So here's our actual code. Let me bring up the Word document so we can run it in that. Uh, and go all the way back down here. So let's... Uh, oh, went a little too far. So now we can go back to this link where we have our Verilog online virtual simulator. And control A, control V. And so we can actually kind of go through this code and see how it works. So um, the way I like to I'll define uh, my parameters in terms of precondition and postcondition, maybe inputs and outputs, and then I'll say what each module does. So this first one, NAND2 gate, oh, this one all the way down. First, first one is the NAND2 gate. We have our module, we have our ports, and we instantiate our inputs, A and B and output Y. Next, we have, it says supply one and supply zero. Supply one and supply zero are reserved uh, values that indicate where our one and zero are. So you can I define them as B, D, and brown. You have the same types of comments. And then format. And so see here we actually have NMOS and PMOS transistors in Verilog. So one thing that's very important, NMOS in Verilog, it's very picky about the order that you put them in. It's going to go drain, source, gate. Drain, source, gate, drain, source, gate. Uh, so we have our PMOS and our internal, so we have the same drain, Y. We have the same source, which is BDD, and then the gate is A and B. So the way the extensions of the, these work, you have the transistor type. And you see this NO here? That means that makes it unique. You can't have more than one. So if you're like copying and pasting and you get an error, see, you can probably see N0 multiple times or something like that. Here, so they're internal. These are in series. So we start from source is net two. The net two is a wire that we can 
uh, has in between the two transistors. So we go from RAM to NET2, and that's controlled by D at the gate. And then NET2 becomes the source for the next NMOS, the next NMOS transistor. And then the drain is Y. And then that goes to A. So that's how we actually design the uh, NAND gate module itself. So the next part is we're going to create the stimulus. So the preconditions are none. The postconditions are A and B. And I call them A and B specifically because we're trying to create two different signals that we are going to stimulate for the NAND gate, right? So our module had two ports, output A and B. You can do this in multiple ways. You can do A and B and then just do output A and B. They're both correct. So something you'll see, if we have registers, we have an array. So you put the array in front of the variable name. So CNT is count. So we begin here. We say count is zero. Repeat four. Begin. This is similar to for i equals zero. Oh, excuse me. So i equals zero, i is less than four, i plus plus, and c. And it's going to add a count. Now here's what's going to happen. Every time it's going to do this assign a b equals count. So what's going to do is this actually converts it from a normal value to binary value. So this would be if I wanted to continue here, make this just to make this a little more clear. So 2 would be A equals 1, B equals 0, and then through would be A equals 1, B equals 1. So it's actually generating the uh, these binary values. And then what's going to happen is the stimulus is going to be combined in the driver. The driver doesn't have any inputs. We just have three wires. So what's going to happen is we initialize by starting with the stimulus. NAND2 underscore stim, which is the name of the module here, right? NAND2 stim. And we create a unique instance of it. So I just called it space and then lowercase stim. So all we need is our outputs. So that's going to be A and B. So the A and B outputs are going to hook to this wire, these two wires, and they're going to be the two inputs to the NAND gate. So you have NAND gate 2, which is the name of the module, the unique instance of the NAND gate, N0, and A, B, and then output Y. So then what we're going to do next is we're going to use this function monitor. It's going to monitor. It's going to tell me the time that's elapsed. And then what's going to happen is every time it changes, it's going to print out the value for A, the value for B, and the value for Y. Just like if we recall, percent B, the binary, Percent B is binary, and percent D is a little different because we have multiple values. It can be 0, 1, it can be strong, it can be weak, it can be X, undefined. Uh, so. so we start with time is percent D here, A, B, and Y, and end. So we run the code, and we have our terminal output. So just like we expected with 0, 0, we get a 1 on the output. 0, 1, after 100 nanoseconds, we get a 1 on the output. After 200 nanoseconds, 1, 0, we get a 1. And then 1, 1, we get a 0. So it's going it starts all over again. So it counts up to 4 and then stops. So the reason why I did every 100 nanoseconds is because when we go here, parameter delays. Recall we're talking about parameters. I said parameter delay. So, and then after you watch the uh, video, if you like, well, we're going to go through a lab to show you how to make this too, but this is actually what the layout of a two-input NAND gate looks like in electric VLSI design. So you can see it goes through A or goes through B to the output and then has to go through both NMOSs for the zero, just like a typical NAND gate. Um, and the last thing I want to do today, I don't, there are no more TGOs. Uh, so the assignment was uh, 1.21 through 1.26, and then example question 1.7, and I don't think there's a 1.8, right? Do we not do it through 1.30? Uh, yeah, that's 
Oh yeah, I'm sorry, 1.30, you're correct. Just, just all the rest of them in uh, section one, through 1.30. What was that website that had the, the tutorial on it? Uh, the tutorial, um, it's vol.verilog. It's, it's on the video. And uh, it is, I can, yeah, it's, it's actually down here. I'll, I'm going to send out the, the link here for the for this too, along with the assignment. So um, basic idea, if you recall, the MIPS processor. Uh, these are all the instruction types at the RTL level. These are the three types, R type, I type, and J type. So this is 32-bit length. Uh, this is an example of a, a Fibonacci sequence that it runs. And then based on the compiling, which uh, Anybody who's done with RTL kind of has the base idea of what you're doing. These are your add immediate, your branch equivalent instructions, your jump instructions, your load and store work. Here it says load byte and store byte because it's an 8-bit instruction. So it translates into machine language, which is in zeros, as you can see. Um, this is the example of the MIPS multi-cycle architecture. Um, we will be going into more detail, but one thing I want to show you, this is the control logic for a, what's known as a multi-cycle implementation. Uh, multi-cycle is actually uses a more complex finite state machine. So if you recall, the more control you have, the more area it incurs. And, um, but here's the, so you start laying it out. And so this is where we kind of get into the floor plan of it. So we actually have the actual size of the controller. And if you were Controller, you get one or zero over here, and you get those that uh, qubit signal goes to the encoder, and four bit signal goes to the code itself. And this all goes into the data path. And then we actually give them the floor plan. These are the actual sizes of your data path and controller. And then here, this is where the difference between custom layout and synthesized layout comes into play. The size of the custom layout, if you actually Kind of work at the uh, custom level where you're, where you're actually working on the cells and working on the transistors, you can get it this small. But if you rely on just the synthesis tool itself, it can pull up to this size. So this is why taking steam off is important. So you can learn how to get past just the synthesis tool and make a smaller, more efficient design. And this is kind of a zoom in of the controller, as you can see. It kind of looks a lot like you're just making logic decisions. And then you have your register files here for your, um, so this would be the data path and this would be the control here. And then these are the pins. So when you actually do tape out, the pins are going into that, uh, into the, into the black chip. And then last but certainly not least, there it is. You have your MIPS processor, you have your pins, you lay it out and that's it. So that's kind of an overview of the process that we're going to be learning about for the rest of the course. So it is 12.14, so I should be dismissing you now. Um, I will email you those two assignments. Um, I'm going to make them separate assignments so you can email them to me at counts as two homeworks instead of just one. Uh, does anybody have any questions before you're dismissed? Nope, I got to get out of here. All right, y'all have a good weekend. <laughs>